terminate on site. Looks like we're not the only two hoodies in town no more. <laughs> Can you imagine how extreme you're going to have to get to take this belt away from me? Because the gangsters in and the gangsters gonna rule ECW. Take us out to the brawl game. Take us out to the crowd. Take us out to the brawl game, Johnny. Cause we just wanna get loud. Take us out to the brawl game, Johnny. Take us out to the ring. Cause if we don't come back with these belts. You know, it don't mean a damn thing. So let's root, root, root for the homeboys. Because if we don't win, it's a shame. It's a one, two, three count, you're out. In the public enemies game. We'll bring our bats. You just make sure you bring your balls. Hello and welcome to the Wrestling 20 Years Ago podcast for section 3 of this month's show focusing on ECW. I am a bit big in the, a bit big in the belly, a bit big in the hiney, but my name is Del Muir and I am joined by the man of the hour, the man with the power, Bobby Bamber. Bob, hello. Good evening, Del. How are you? Very well, very well. We were meant to be joined by a third party, but we won't involve them. They've seemingly done a sabu last month, Bob, and just took the, Took the loyalty elsewhere well, for well, a higher well, he, paying he, job. He did at least tell us he wasn't going to be here. Well, that's um, true. We didn't need to leave voicemails on his phone. No, and he's um, not in Japan, so there's that as well. Well, there's that, yep. Um, like another, another solid month, Bob, for, for ECW. Um, starting off with the, the news, I'm going to fire off to yourself here, Bob, if you want to kick us off with the news for this month. I will do indeed. Uh, Shane Douglas is set to finish up with ECW on July the 1st with a contract from the WWF ready for him to sign. It said that relations between Douglas and Paul Heyman have broken down in recent months to the point where they're finding it difficult to work together. Douglas will likely enter the WWF as a heel and is already slated to work with Shawn Michaels later this year. And also we've got a, can a couple of newcomers related to ECW TV this month. First off, we've got Bill Alfonso, the former WWF official. Played quite a big part in this month's hardcore TV, often appearing to ruin some of the moments that we've come to love from ECW. These included what many believe to be the crowning of a new ECW champion in Cactus Jack. He'd knocked out the champion Sandman for the count of ten. Was declared the new champion, but then Alfonso came out demanded that the match continue, and after quoting the rules, he would then restart the match. Sandman would go on to retain the title in somewhat dubious circumstances, but we will have a few of that later on. And another familiar face to add to June's Hardcore TV is the repackaged Taz. Gone are the furry singlet and the Taz maniac moniker, and in their place is a straight-up beat-down submission machine, gone down, just called Taz. Goes back to his colour commentary spot last month, which spoke about on the show, and it kind of sees him present a more realistic on-scene persona. And last up for possibly familiar faces, ECW unveiled a pretty deadly-looking new tag team this month who've already made their Martin the Champions the public enemy. New Jack and Mustafa, perhaps known to others from Smoky Mountain Wrestling as the Gangsters, debuted this month, and the two of them, as I said, have already laid out Johnny and Rocco and are set for their first title match next month. And after talk of familiar faces appearing in ECW for June, one who may not be appearing in the near future is Chris Benoit. The Canadian went east this month for a tryout with the WWF. He faced Bob Holly in a dark match. At this time, Benoit remains uncontracted, but we'll be having discussion over potential signees and suitors for him and others at the end of the show. Hey, hey, Johnny, what are you doing? Stuff like that. I told you to take that stuff off, off the plane. What? Oh, he did. I told you to take that goofy-looking suit off when you got off the plane. You know, you know very well that the Emperor of Japan gave me this here sword. That means something. Yeah, but... But you take that silly costume off your back and he made a stick now. But you know, in the land of the rising sun, 
They say public enemy. It's bad. Oh, do that, Johnny thinks he's bisexual. That's bilingual, oh, goofy. Oh, sorry, Johnny. Where you been? I've been shopping, you yeah. know. Down there, that's a pretty good store. Had that big, big sign in the window. It said, going out of business, everything must go to the public. Oh, so you went in and you went going shopping and now you's gone. Exactly, man. <laughs> exactly. Got, got, got some some good stuff. Stuff. Got some good stuff. Yeah, look, look right here. This, this be right here. Super polygrip, converse, astro turf, leaping high, baseball shoes. That's a fine looking shoe. We're gonna look good in the hood with these Ooh, baby. Hot I ain't gonna too, get baby. Baby. <laughs> it's here. It's gonna be. Oh. Baseball hat. Tigers. Tigers. Yeah, the need that hat. Yeah, I a ball game. <laughs> but no, you know, I found this out. You're gonna love this one. These here be big league sunglasses for baseball players. You know why? Look this, Rocco. Cause they gotta catch lights. Stadium lights. They were like, come down from the side, catch the ball. I think I just stick with our glasses, Johnny. I like mine better. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, wait a minute, Johnny. You ain't been drinking that sake you can't have. Uh-uh. I got to watch this boy close, because in Japan, he was drinking lots of that sake, and oh, he gets crazy on it. Hey, I'm gonna hit me some balls, oh, man. Get it out. Okay, first. press that swing for the ball game. Come here, like hey, Nate, man. What's that, Johnny? I'm scared. Big league, chew. Everybody knows big league's playing chew. Big league, chew. That ain't no chew, Johnny. This is the real chew. Right here ain't no big league chew. You gotta have the real thing. He must think I'm nuts. If nobody can recognize the Philly blood, Johnny Grunts can recognize the Philly blood. Ooh, that's bad. Yeah, baby. Well, well Johnny, I'm ready. So, that's the news. Cracking on with the TV review for the month. We start on June the 6th. And pretty much summing up ECW this month, just no messing about. We cut straight into the... They broadcast and were right into a brawl between Hack Myers and Hitman Tony Stetson, the Broad Street Bully. Bully's in Commando Myers earlier on, the crowd just lambasting heat at him. A low blow gets Myers back in control, but after two top rope fist drops, he can't get the win. ECW's crowds, we've spoke about them already this year, I'd imagine we'll be continuing to do so, but just a brilliant spot from the, the Philadelphia faithful this month for the usual shout, Sha for any offence that Hack Myers is getting in. This month they upped their game and started chanting shit for anyone that anyone else was getting in. So Tony Stetson gets those crowd chants. A nice high spot at the end. Myers diving onto Stetson's face, down into the mat with both knees from the top rope for the win. Um, we then get a quick recap of last month's TV title rematch between Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko. Big focus on this one though. As we said in the news, it is on Taz. Come back to his colour commentary spots. Try to build him up as a big deal. And it's really just showing a further push in this new Taz with the, the highlights of a terrific match, but with that focus being on Peterson Ercher or Taz and colour commentary. We then get a brilliant Paul E. Dangerously promo talking again about Taz. He says he doesn't need a gimmick. Compares him to Charles Barkley and Dennis Rodman of the NBA. He said Taz just needs to be Taz. No gimmicks required. The Tasmaniac is dead. Long live Taz. And I don't know about you, Bob, but just one of the kind of highlights for me every month we seem to talk about it, the public enemy. We've got a, a pre-tape from them, kind of interspersed with highlights of their, their recent tour of Japan as well. Building up to next month's live event, the Brawl Games, we get a bit of a, a recap for Joey Styles, breaking down what that includes. Um, so we'll look forward to reviewing that next month when the Public Enemy bring that bring that fight into the into the ECW arena. We've got Johnny Grunge, just brilliant, standing in a local cage for the practice in baseball. Johnny's got the dressing gown on, trying to act as if it's a kimono. He's got a samurai sword, and he's showing Rocco Rock his new sunglasses. He's had to buy these because the arenas that they're going to be filling in the near future, those arena lights are going to be blinding them. Um, now back to, as Bob was saying at the start of our news, we've got a Shane Douglas recap, kind of building up more 
the kind of aftermath of a potential leaving for Shane Douglas and it's focusing on Bill Alfonso. It shows him from last month ending the, the ending of the Dreamer, Tommy Dreamer and Raven match when that was stopped by Bill Alfonso. We've then got Todd Gordon again saying that ECW has no rules and we've then got the table bump and the barbed wire fist from the Cactus Jack and Sandman title match from last month. So it could well be one of the last matches that we're going to see Shane Douglas and ECW all going according to plan. He may well be in WWF in the future. But one of the last matches that we saw was him coming in. The chant, the fans chanting Shane is dead as he comes in for his match with the Sandman. We've got a brawl to start. The Sandman's previously bust up his head in the, the night before. Joey Styles actually reveals that this was Sandman's second defence of the evening. It was actually the live event after that match with Cactus Jack that had appeared earlier. Reviewed that at the end of the last one show, but this is the follow-up from the same night. Pretty slow, slow match, really. Um, Sandman's just legitimately selling really, really heavy in the injuries he's got. Obviously, that bust-up head that Douglas is working over early as well. Lovely bit for Shane Douglas, where he actually goes over the top rope, skins the cart, then gets Sandman, who's still in the ring, into a head scissors. Launches him to the outside and then follows it up with a flying tope. Um, nice sell from Joey Styles in the commentary, commentary position as well, selling that history with Ricky Steamboat that Shane Douglas has. That's obviously something he picked up from his mentor along the way. Um, franchise staying in control. Gets a springboard crossbody onto a flat and sandman. Only gets a two count. Champion then takes it to the outside, whips Douglas into the guardrail and then suplexes him onto it. Sandman gets a table. Puts Douglas on it, drops him, and kind of lays him onto the long onto the concrete just on the top of this table that's set up on the outside. So standing in vertical suplex from Sandman, but he doesn't capitalise and get the pin. There's a scoop slam with Shane Douglas, gets him sent on from the apron. Sandman misses his top leg, uh, top rope leg drop, and Douglas again just starts to work over that head in the corner, busting him up again with his feet. Sandman versus Douglas' belly to belly, but his franchise gets a foot in the rope, down comes Cactus Jack, shoves it off, and Bill Alfonso tells the referee to restart the match. So, first week of the month, we've got Bill Alfonso already kind of stating his claim for being the, possibly one of the top heels in the business at the minute. When Cactus shoves off that, that foot of Shane Douglas's, the, the match gets restarted. Cactus blocks um, blocks a cane shot from Sandman when he goes to hit Alfonso. Douglas rolls him up. Sandman, we have a new ECW champ. No, we don't. The referee argues with um, Bill Alfonso. And uh, what was the name of the referee, Bob? Oh, Mike, somebody, Jim, wasn't it? Jim Molino, was it? Ah, oh, I don't remember that. You might be right. can't remember. The two of them fight amongst themselves. We don't. John Finnegan. Easy. Yeah, we don't. don't know where I got that. Mike from. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking that. Jim Molino, I had him. I'm sure there's somebody else that's pretty regular in the ECW, but the two of them start fighting amongst themselves. Um, Cactus obviously isn't the ECW champion, as we thought he may well be, but then the referees argue amongst themselves. Cactus and Douglas then look as if they're going to set off, but the shooter, Dean Malenko, runs out, attacks Jack. He gets run off by Tommy Dreamer. Raven and Steve Richards come out. They beat down Dreamer and Cactus, and a DDT leaves Tommy out cold as we fade to black. Bob, I just want to discuss something quickly on this, just the last bit of the, the first week of Hardcore TV. Joey Styles revealed that this was the Sandman's second defence of the evening. Anybody that heard the show last month would have heard, obviously, the, the kind of mental spot with the table where Sandman gets launched over the rope head first with a table lander on top of him. We've then got Cactus Jack coming out, wrapping his full arm and his fist in particular in barbed wire. Should, should Sandman be defending a belt two times after that was the first match? Um, no. It is, well, it's really, really the long and short answer, I suppose. Um, you know, particularly after that bump. But generally, I, I don't think it's it's particularly productive to have these double title defences. Mm. It, it, it kind of made sense given that, you know, it's like, well, 
he, he's got, you know, Douglas has got claim to a, a shot of the championship, which, you know, he hadn't had before this one. Yeah. And, you know, Cactus Jack is the guy, the, the number one contender, if you like. Um, so it makes sense, but I think it's kind of, if you're going to do two matches in one night, then you're going to have to tone them down. Um, and I, I'm, yeah. I wouldn't have done it, let's say that long story short. But you Well, know. I mean, I suppose I suppose the question that I'm really more getting to at the brunt of this, Bob, is, I mean, do you think this builds up Sandman as, as like a warrior, as somebody that's there to defend his honour and fight to the fight to the death, or do you think it just kind of dismisses what Cactus Jack had already went through? Do you think it makes him look weak, or does it just further dilute this, this use of the word extreme that we use? I suppose that's my real question. Uh, well, the, I've probably got comments more per, pertaining to, to other things this month regarding whether they're diluting the, uh, the extreme brand. I don't know, I mean, it, 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 you know, if it comes across on TV like it's two separate weeks, then I don't think it matters as much, you know. The, the, the logistics of stuff at live events that translates to TV, I don't think you're all that worried about. Um, I don't think it devalues Sandman, um, or really the other guys when you watch the, the two matches they go through. I mean, to, to pass comment briefly on the match that we'd just seen, I actually thought this was about as good as this combination, this pairing was ever going to get. Um, in terms of you could tell that Douglas was working harder than usual to try and like drag a below average match out of, uh, out of Sandman. Whether he got there or not, I'm not quite sure, but they both worked hard and you could tell that Douglas was perhaps trying a few things that in amongst or up against up other opponents he wouldn't have done. Um, so yeah, decent effort. And as I said, I don't know whether the fact that this was his second match translated all that heavily to television. I don't know whether your average viewer was going, this is his second match in the night, given that it was a different show. That's true, and I mean, it's definitely something that's pretty unique about ECW as well, we're having that, that TV set up where it is really just highlights for these live super shows that they're having, so maybe I've just looked a wee bit too much into that, but thanks for your, thanks for your thoughts, Bob. Um, moving on, we've got 13th, June 13th, and it starts again with a recap of April's Hostel City Showdown, and we've got Terry Funk. Bob, I've got a bone to pick with you here. You said this match would never make it to TV. I was pretty shocked to see it. Um, we've got Terry Funk flying about with a flaming brand and iron. He's going to Cactus Jack. There's a couple of times where we think Cactus might be catching on fire, as we spoke about at the time. But again, it's really just acting as a, a bit of a further build to this Cactus Shane Douglas story. Um, I would add these were highlights. Well, that I, is my, true. That is my, true. My, very, my comments are pertaining to the full yeah, match, so I, very, I'm, very, I'm very, still in credit. Very edited highlights at that as well. <laughs> Um, and we got um, Joey Styles clearing up that the that the commanding referee John Finnegan he rega- he remained in charge of that match, and Sandman remained as champion. Just going back to the issue with Bill Alfonso that we had, so Sandman is still the champion. And then we've just got a phenomenal, really phenomenal Cactus Jack promo at this point, which I'm sure we'll be hearing at some point during the show if we haven't already. Well, but, well, I'll uh, tell you what, Dale, we, we we might as well just. Well, put it in now. I've talked about quite a few things the past several weeks right here on ECW television. Friendship, family, pride, and world heavyweight championships. Well, this Saturday night, they don't exactly apply. Because this Saturday night, Sandman, when the ropes go down and the barbed wire goes all around... We get to explore a very dark side of my personality. A side I'm not so proud of, but a side I can't deny. And very deep in my heart, Sandman, there lies a lust for blood that I can't deny. And there lies a lust for blood that you won't be able to run away from. Because we're not just talking man against man. We're talking man against thing. And in my life, Sandman, there's never made a thing that made me feel this sick. And this good at the same time as the wire that stands before you. In the memory of Eddie Gilbert, the fans remember they had to cut Cactus Jack down. My loving wife and my side hoping our man would still be alive. 
And I consider that Mad Sandman the greatest night in my life. You ask me, Sandman, they say, an easy life, the hand. And where's the crown? Well, you're damn right. Because we better both lie awake at night. But the difference between you and me, Sandman, is I don't need 16 beers to step into the ring. I don't need 16 beers to lower my inhibitions because I don't have a damn one to begin with. So you tell me, Sandman, you tell me how bad do you really want to remain the world champion? And how bad do you want to remain on this earth? Because I'm coming after you with the worst intentions I've ever held. And if I can capture the heavyweight championship belt in the meantime, well, that's super duper good just as well. Bang, bang! Bob, would you make of these Cactus Jack promos? Um, well, I, I read about them on the website this month. I mean, he's... He, he, he's, he, yeah, we, well, I, I don't want to butcher the, the, uh, the home run thing, but he, he, he's hitting one after another out the park. Exactly. It, it, it's strange. I mean, one that, well, it, it, to a point that Douglas isn't really cutting promos anymore. Um, but even in, uh, even at a time when Ric Flair is both back on television and back as a major part of WCW storylines, I think Cactus Jack's way out in front promo wise. I mean, it's, you know, it, you couldn't do this any more frequently than he's doing. He's doing about one big promo a month. And, you know, if you try to make this like a, a WCW type thing where he was cutting maybe two, three, four promos a month, I don't know that it would work. Um, but the frequency is just about right. And, you know, there's enough different things going on. He's got enough motivation for things to say where it just about works. But these are fantastic. Um, as I say, he's... He's got a very good art for just kind of building and building and building and like, I, you could create a really weird montage of the opening 60 seconds of every Cactus Jack promo and they'd all sound really weird. They'd all be really odd, strange references and yet each one, you know, without really telegraphing it too well, he's able to kind of stitch together this promo and bring things back up and wrap them up as he kind of builds this crescendo almost. Um, and yeah, he is, on another level, I think to anybody else right now, I include Flair, I include Douglas, I include someone like Jerry Lawler. I don't know that there's a better promo out there. And um, I think he's already wrapped up the, the 95 Promo of the Year award, running in June, but I don't think, I think even if he stopped now, I don't know that anyone else could catch him up between now and then. And dare I say we could possibly, when I said that in April or May as well, I mean, yeah. as you say, he always goes full circle, he always sells a match. And even kind of listening to that with something, watching it's even better because you see it set to the side of him wearing a barbed wire crown as well. And as you see, he has just looking really, really bright for the future, Cactus Jack. I mean, it's nice to get him kind of having this TV time with the mic that he maybe didn't get as much as he should have in WCW. But as you say, even with Ric Flair in the top of his game in the 70s and 80s with the, with the NWA, this was, this was something else. And, I don't think we really need to talk about that much more. Um, Joey Styles, cutting back to him after Cactus, talks up the tag division, some couple of pending matches, talks through that brawl game situation for next month, as we spoke about, and the pending outcomes of these matches as well. So talking up the tag division, we then start with a match, and it's the public enemy, champions, they're going up against the pit bulls, and the stipulation of this one is a double dog collar match. For any old school fans, come back to the 70s and 80s, you can find a dog collar match, and kind of most commonly Memphis, I would have thought. Um, but looking at this one, it's a tag team affair, so we've got um, Steve Richards now bringing out the pit bulls at the start there, and they're aligned with the Raven in the crowd, as ever, behind the, the public enemy. So Johnny, um, Johnny Crunch really coming on with the microphone at the start of this match as well. Todd Gordon's out here as well, selling this double dog call stipulation. Rocco is going to be tied up with Pitbull 2, and Johnny is going to be tied to Pitbull 1 with the dog collars on a leash, and both of them will be tied to each other for the remainder of the match. Pretty slow start, but Grunge and Pitbull 1 go to the outside. 2 then misses a, an axe handle onto Rocco. Rock goes for a powerbomb, gets a near fall pretty early. 
but then Rocco gets outside, chokes out two over the guardrail and hits him with a soda can and a rolling pin. Um, back with, with Johnny Grunge, um, there's a couple of frying pan shots to Pitbull, one from him. Johnny then goes to splash him from the apron and the both of them are already gushing blood at this point. Um, back in the ring, Steve Richards passes a table and Pitbull 2 power slams Rocco from the, ta- the top of the table that's placed in the turnbuckle gets a near fall. We then cut to commercial. After that, Rocco then moonsaults Pitbull 2 through the table and the fans chant, fuck Sabu. Carton back to Sabu, no showing. Don't need him. We've got Flyboy Rocco Rock. Well, it's so also it, a more general heart back to that's a Sabu esque move. Well, I that's it. Anybody that does anything remotely similar, like a, a seated centaur or the the moonsault for the top rope, they don't need Sabu. They don't want Sabu. They've got what they have. Uh, to get uh, and also the, the table fact, I, th- I think, is probably well, just yeah, as much any about kind that of tables, well. chairs, anything that's getting used. Fuck Sabu, we don't need them, we've got these guys, which is, is admirable to an extent. I'm sure they would maybe still kind of have a wee bit of a pop for him if he came back, but as we are at the minute, we don't need them, we've got Flyboy Rocco Rock. So talking with Rocco, we get back up to the Eagles Nest, up with Joey Styles, and Rocco hits a cent on, but misses the lady at the table, and they both bleed as well, so we've now got all four gushing blood at this point. Pitbull 2 manages to suplex Rocco through the table, but there's no re- there's no referee for the cover. Referee's tied up in the ring with Pitbull 1 and Johnny Grunge. So Pitbull 1 hits Johnny with a chair. The enemy then launched the Pitbulls onto Steve Richards in the apron through a table on the outside, which the fans love. Both Pitbulls go for suplexes, but Johnny gets pinned and Rocco pins Pitbull 2. So as per the rules... The enemy get five minutes alone with Steve Richards because the referee counted Rocco pinning Pitbull too. But after the fight, Steve gets the upper hand because the two of them have obviously just been brawling in the full arena and they're gushing blood. Steve gets the early, early hand, Steve Richards, but the enemy managed to turn it around, start laying into Richards and the crowd yell for blood. Rocco goes for the drive-by, but Raven comes in from the back, throws him off the top, and then all four of them, Raven, Richards, and the Pitbulls, all go for the, the public enemy, beat them down. Tommy Dreamer comes out, tries to get the the upper hand back in the favour of the, the public enemy, but he gets his hands in Raven, but Richards blasts Tommy with a chair. Bueller, watching from the apron, quite happy, what's happening? One of a Sean then runs out to try and batter Steve Richards and succeeds. Dreamer again pile drags Bueller and the innovator of violence and the newfound queen of extreme stand tall. Bob, where do you, where do you see this, this feud going with, with Dreamer and Richards? I mean, we spoke with Dreamer and Raven, sorry, we spoke about trying to keep this fresh for how long it's been going on. I, I was thinking this was actually quite a, quite a good way to do it. We're kind of tying in the pit bulls with Avon and Richards, but then just having Dreamer in at the end, it kind of keeps that still quite fresh, I thought. Yeah, they, they've basically taken the approach that, well, to a point, they've kind of put the, the, the Raven and Dreamer thing not on hold, um, but they've kind of said, okay, we can keep it going, but we can have mm. them feuding with other people at the same time and in amongst other programs. Because if you're going to, let, you know, if you've got, you've got six months in, you might as well try and go for the year. Um, if you're gonna get that far, you're gonna need enough layers. And you're, you know, because ultimately, eventually, this is gonna end with Dreamer pinning, you know, Dreamer facing Raven one on one, maybe inside a cage, I don't know. But eventually, you've gotta strip all the layers back, and eventually, Dreamer's gotta win. So that's fair enough. But I think if you're gonna go, real long with this because I think if a, if a feud goes I don't think the feud has actually been all that brilliant uh, you know as a whole it's been very mm-hmm. good and maybe you know in a few months time when it finishes we'll reflect on it being very good but it's moved fairly slowly you know and it's it's been a case of Dreamer gets close to the win but I can't get the job done you do that a few times you add in a few extra stories and there are some things we've got to develop later in the thing um, but yeah no I, I, I like what they've been I like what they're doing with it, and I think it's important as well. You can kind of keep this view bubbling under for a while while these two almost do go off and do other things. Yeah, and I mean, just keeping up this this pace that we've got so far for ECW this month, 
on to the kind of last bit of the. Shall, the shall we review the match, Del? Shall we? Shall we talk about that? The, uh, yeah, the... I mean, by all by all means, but what did you do? You make it asking a double collar situation. Uh, I, I want to give both teams a lot of praise for working bloody hard. Yeah. Um, and and, and you're actually putting on a, a pretty good match as well. You know, in terms of this is the kind of thing which can end up just being like an archetypal ECW brawl. Dare I say archetypal? Um, but yeah, they all work very hard. They came up with uh, enough innovative spots where the match felt fresh. Um, the, the, you know, we, we've seen before, you know, dog collar strap type matches where it can almost be a hindrance. In this case, it wasn't. In this case, they were able to do enough with it, but, you know, the, the, the quote unquote chain, be- or the chain between the, the dog collars was long enough where they could, both teams could still really do what they wanted. Um, difficulty to follow along on TV, but again, you yeah, know, we have to always say, you know, the part of this is for the fans in the arena. I'm sure they had a great time. And uh, I, I thought the exchange around the, um, uh, I don't want to call it the stage, really, the eagle's nest, I guess you'd say, the bit by the, the hard camera position uh, with the bit where you've got uh, Rocco Rock kind of not at the top of a ladder, but kind of stood on a ladder that's propped up against a ledge, like a step ladder almost. And then you've got a table laid out and you've got one of the pit bulls, I think number two at the bottom. Yeah. And he kind of pulls him, he yanks him down and then, um, Rocco Rock does another Sabu type spot going flying through a table. Um, yeah, really good match. I've got some bigger issues with how sustainable all this is and whether, you know, the, the, how much further you can go with all this stuff, but I think we'll touch on that later in the show. But in terms of match itself, really well done to all four guys in goal, involved. Um, the finish was, nah, was what it was. And, you know, th- there's another point that I, I mentioned before, that they're, they're still surviving too many big spots, even in a tag situation. Um, but, but, yeah, be interested to know what you think, Del. I, I kind of agree with that last bit in particular, Bob. I think it, it's really... You can get away with it to an extent with tag matches if the outcome of those those big, big high spots are the, the tag teams, the tag team partners breaking up or if it's something like Pitbull 2 and Rocco up the Eagles' nest, Pitbull 2 goes for the cover, the referee isn't there. Things like that you can get away with, but when the four of them's gushing blood... Working their arses off, kind of just going hell for leather in the full match, and then there's like huge spots getting just dismissed with two counts and things, and then the the ending when we've spoken before about Paul Heyman, not Paul E, but Paul Heyman trying to stay away for these kind of dodgy finishes and kind of unclean finishes. I kind of agree. He's not. He's not. Yeah. I mean, that's, like, <laughs> what, 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 whatever we said in the news a few months ago, either was a was a red herring or it was just incorrect, because um, because that's not happening. Yep. Um, but I mean, as you say, just absolutely hats off to the work ethic. I mean, the, the dog collar steps a lot like a cage match sometimes, but it really can be a hindrance to the guys involved in it. But as you say, the four of them absolutely worked sweat tears and sweat and tears off themselves and. Uh, blood obviously but um, it's just an absolute testament to the, the, the work ethic of these guys that's in this roster where they are prepared to do quite literally anything to just for the entertainment of that crowd and the, the TV audience I think it does definitely come across as well maybe not as much as the live crowd but when your main focus as a business is the live crowd you can certainly understand that um, and go back to, to last month, Bob, just to kind of finish off the June 13th show with a wee bit of drama, a bit of days of your lives last month when we'd Sandman and Douglas and Cactus back in the locker room with a with kind of da-da-da moment this month. Um, June 13th finishes up with Johnny and Rocco, the public enemy. They're back in the hood, showing off their new car. Johnny's got a new car, he's showing it off to Rocco. But they see a tag. Were they in the hood or were they just like outside the ECW? They might arena? have been. They might have been the ECW. And they, 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 arena. Get, I just they were getting in a car, so I'm assuming they were maybe not as directly outside, but I'm assuming they were close. That's that. They're maybe just outside after the show or before the show. I always just assume when I see the enemy, they're in the hood because they are the kings of the hood. But are they, Bob? We've got another tag sprayed on the wall, and it looks like there's another pair of hoodies about. 
who may well have it in for the public enemy. Dum, dum, yeah, it said, it said, uh, T-P-E-T-O-S, which they, uh, they recognised as the public enemy terminate on site. Come on, T. I got myself a pretty automobile. Look, Look at the bags in I there. I got all the bags. We rolling now, T. My name. It's nice. <laughs> you driving? No, you drive, John. No, I don't have a shotgun. I ain't got no license. We got no license either. Yeah, but I get five, John. You only get one if they catch uh, you. Not don't drive. give me no hard time. Just drive. Rocco. Johnny, don't give me no hard time. Just get in there and drive. Rocco. What, Johnny? Who be tagging on us, G? Oh, Johnny. I don't feel so good. Rocco. I know TPE. We the public enemy. Explain what's going on, G. Johnny, I don't like this, but what's wrong? TOS terminate on site. Looks like we're not the only two hoodies in town no more. So, starting on with the, the month of Hardcore TV, we then go on to June 20th and continuing just a hectic month for ECW this month. Really no, no fat to trim in the, the TV product at all this month. We start with Hitman Tony Stetson, the Broad Street Bully, and he's going up against a New Jersey devil who is basically a local jobber dressed up as one of the, the local N, uh, NHL guys. Um, he comes out, gets the quick win, but then we see 911 who comes out, does a choke slam onto the devil, then follows it up with three more. So we've got four choke slams to this poor, poor man. Bob, I've, I talk about this every month, but I genuinely think 911's choke slam might well be my favourite move in the business at this point. I don't know about you. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, it, and it's really convincing the way he delivers it as well. I mean, you see sometimes with these choke slams getting done, where it kind of looks pretty weak by the time that they come back down to the mat. But this man delivers it. Yeah, I mean, what I think helps is that ECW is a roster where the average height is, you know, maybe just shy of six foot. There's a lot of guys sure. in there that aren't that tall, and it's not to say nine one one is short. He's not. I think he's about six nine. But it I would helps. Go out and meet him. No, but it but it helps when you're tall when all the other guys aren't that tall and that you stand out a bit more. Even Ron Simmons comes in as a really big bloke in ECW. In WCW, he's just above average. So I think that mm. helps. But yeah, uh, I, I'd say that. That's right up there in terms of uh, uh, of effective moves. Um, nothing else really comes to mind, I would say. Yeah, and I mean, kind of moving on again, we just get another quick, quick match where we get Mikey Whipwreck uh, managing to go for a, a kind of five hundred pound monster that he was in the ring with. So we've got Tony Stetson getting the win, Mikey Whipwreck getting a win, and next start we cut to in ring and it's Todd Gordon, Commissioner Gordon, and Bill Alfonso arguing in the the middle of the ring. They get to shoving eventually, and half the locker room then runs out and has to hold Gordon back. Um, we get another another debutant. Going up against Hack Myers. Bit more of a story with this one. Hack Myers in the ring goes for the win with an almost Undertaker-esque leg drop. But the opponent that he's going up with, the Vampire Warrior, gets a win with a DDT. Steve Richards, everyone's kind of lovable role, comes out, aligns himself with the Vampire Warrior. And it's then declared that, well, the Vampire Warrior declares that Luna Vachon is his woman. And he wants Tommy Dreamer to get his hands off her. It's then revealed by Joey Styles that the vampire warrior is none other than Miss Luna Vachon's estranged husband. Where is Jerry Springer when you need him, Bob? Yes, yes. It, 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 to, to be fair, in terms of casting a uh, a husband for Luna, they did a pretty good job here. <laughs> it, 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 it this, was... this was what I was imagining. Yeah, whoever cast it needs needs to get out of Philly and go to Hollywood because, my God, if you to pick your stereotypical man slash beast for Luna, the vampire warrior's up there. And, I mean, next up, it's it's a first for me, I think, in my time reviewing E! Extreme Championship Wrestling, Bob. We've got a woman versus woman, a women's match in Philadelphia. Um, it's Beulah going up against the aforementioned Luna Vachon. Bula comes out, 
full gimmick as usual, little short skirt, nice little blouse on, starts teasing the crowd, strips down to a, strips down to a leotard, obviously playing up to the, possibly the best legs in the business, part maybe yourself or me, Bob. Um, Luna comes out, quite the, quite the opposite, I think we know where this is going, she's looking pumped. Luna's obviously just going to run right in this one, but as Raven distracts the referee, Steve Richards comes in with a chair, blasts Luna to the back, and Beulah gets the three. Simple as that, a couple of seconds in. We then get C- Raven... Can I point out a little bit of absurdity to all this? Not, not that it... Certainly, Bob, there's plenty to pick. Not, not that it really matters, but the implication here was that the referee was chatting slash distracted by... Uh, Raven and Bueller, which uh-huh. allowed Richards to come in from the other side of the ring and smack Luna over the back with a chair. All yes. well and good, but given that Luna was probably two feet away from the referee and the chair <laughs> made a sound like a, like a slightly low level gunshot as it hit yep. her, I, I don't buy the idea the referee didn't see or hear that. Are you starting to be on Bill Alfonso's side in this company, Bob? There's, there's a couple. There's another one at the end of this show where I'm like, look, for all, for all, for all Bill Alfonso's, for all Bill Alfonso's heel tendencies, there are a couple of occasions where he has a very good point. We'll come to another one at the end of this, uh, end of this uh, June twentieth show. Carry on. Yeah. So uh, Bueller gets the Bueller gets the unexpected win over Luna. We then get Raven, the henchman, coming back into the back into the ring. DDT's Luna. Loads that boot up as we've seen at the start of this Tommy Dreamer feud and punts Luna in the head. Tommy Dreamer runs out where he's kind of trying to kind of save the, save his accomplice and Luna, but he then gets his fingers broken by Raven for his troubles. This was just an amazing visual with Tommy just writhing about in pain. It really looks convincing. They do it brilliantly. The hands are covered in blood. And we then go to the outside. Raven then handcuffs Luna to the ropes, grabs a chair, but then Tommy manages, ever the hero, to crawl over, gets in front of Luna and takes the hat. Bob, where's the, um, where's the vampire warrior here? Luna's, Luna's getting DDT'd, punting the head. Our defender is getting his hands broken. We've seen the vampire warrior at the start of this show. He wants Tommy Dreamer to get his hands off his woman. He's apparently aligned with Raven and Richards. Where was he at this point? Uh, uh, neutral, I, I would guess, given that his woman was getting attacked, but she was getting attacked in part by uh, his cohort. So I don't know mm. is the answer in short. They, they, that, that was the first question. question that came to my head. I, I couldn't really get my head around that, but you've explained it reasonably well, so I'll move on. So moving on, we've then got the the six man tag as promised earlier in the evening. We've got Raven and the Pit Bulls going up against two called Scorpio, the new Taz, and Tommy Dreamer. But obviously, as we were previous to the commercial, Tommy Dreamer pretty much no state to continue. So out to a hero's welcome comes none other than the shaman Hack Myers comes out to cover for Tommy, but. Everyone's favourite referee, Bill Alfonso, comes out, sends Myers to the back, big heat from the crowd. The three of them, Raven and the Pitbull, start to work over Scorpio. Taz comes out then after he's introduced to suplex them all. And Taz, at this stage, first time we're seeing him in ring with this new repackage look, looks a lot more legitimate with that black northern singlet. No fur anymore, no Taz maniac, but Paul E is still by his side. So the faces managed to work over Pitbull too. Styles really putting them over well in the commentary. Raven gets a bit of momentum on Scorpio and the Bulls tag in quickly. Scorpio hits a monkey flip and a beautiful modified arm drag. Taz gets back in, battles with Raven. Hot tag to Scorpio who cleans house. Pitch perfect moonsault as ever from too cold to Pitbull 2. But Pitbull 1 comes in, breaks up the pin. There's a funny spot on the outside where Paul E berates a girl with a Steve Richards sign. And then back in the ring, we've got Scorpio going up top, goes for the 450, or plans to anyway, but Taz actually suplexes the planned target in the pit bulls. They the two have a kind of brief argument really in the middle of the ring, Scorpio and Taz, with that kind of apparent mix-up in battle plans that they've got. As they have that argument, Raven drags Beulah and Richards to the back. So it's the Pitbulls 
they ran the line. They lay out Taz, but they then get distracted when they're looking to see where Ravens went. Taz gets the pit bulls onto the second rope, and I think it was pit bull two, gets a second rope suplex down to the mat, gets the win. Taz and Too Cold overcome the odds and win the handicap match. Post match, we then get Paulie building up Taz again, but Scorpio blows up it dangerously, smacks him, goes for Taz, but then just gets a beautiful, a beautiful T-bone suplex for his cheek. Bob, this is the first we've seen Taz and Ring since the Taz Maniac gimmick. Would you make him? Um, very good. I, I, I like what they've done with it. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, ECW trying to be like, not like, uh, the WWF and mm-hmm. not overdoing their characters. And Taz Maniac was one of the few guys left who, you know, had that big kind of furry singlet on <laughs> and, and the hair and, you know, the idea, you know, there was the bit, was it, um, when he was, God, we've got about Jason all those months, we've not been on TV for a while. Back when he was feuding with Jason, when he kind of like started eating a bit of wool and there was a yep. bit where he kind of like took a chunk out of his face, or at least he tried to. <laughs> and it was all a bit like, yeah, they're trying to portray Taz as almost like non-human. I think there was one point where. Yeah, Paulie um, went in holiday, went to the rainforest, found Taz and brought him back to rest. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how sustainable that is, and I don't know how much that works in a company that's trying to be very realistic and not trying to have too many overt characters. Um, I don't know how well necessarily that would work. But yeah, this was, um, this was very good, and, and I thought the kind of, um, the Scorpio Taz kind of breakup type thing, I thought that came across quite well as well. Yep. And I mean, again, just non, non-stop for, for ECW this full month. As soon as we've got that, Scorpio hitting Paul E, Taz suplex, and then we're straight back into the ring, cut to the public enemy. They're in the ring, crowd lap them up as ever, dancing along with the seat, the entrance music. We then get Axel Rotten coming out with his barbed wire bat. He gets a mic again, kind of similar to Johnny Grunge earlier in the month. It's kind of actually really polished in the, the last couple of months that we've seen in his feud with Ian and then now talking solo. He just really coming across really well. Tries to build himself up as the real king of hardcore and his mystery partner for leaving it to go up against the enemy. It's none other than his brother Ian, the bad breed. They're back. But again, who comes out? Bill Alfonso. Goes back to January's breakup stipulation. Again, threatens to shut down ECW for breach of contract. Bob, he's, he's an absolute prick, Bill Alfonso, but he does it amazingly. Well, he is a prick, but but this was perfectly reasonable. This, this is yeah. the kind of thing that, that e, ECW would criticise other companies for, a lack of attention to detail, yeah. a lack of drawing back on history. You know, as much as when um, uh, when Axel came out and um, he, he said, my, I'm going to tag my brother Ian, as much as I went, ah, that's quite logical. They, they, they've gone back to the idea that the only other good redeemable feature about either of these men while they're not wrestling each other is wrestling together. And then it was like, yeah, but he's right. Um, uh, 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 They split up, they'll never team again. (laughs) And then what followed was kind of like, okay, Mm. yeah, I'll I'll just about go with that. When uh, you, you'll explain what followed now. Exactly. I mean, what basically happens is Axel's out with that that bad boy, but he says he's here for a fight. But if he's not allowed to team with Ian, then he'll, he'll just fight him. So the two of them brawl to the back. The public enemy dance. No, I think, I think the they bags. brawl out the arena, don't they? They just kind of get yeah, out they, the door. Yeah, right through to the back. Out of fire exit into the street. God knows where they end up. Next to a dumpster covered in blood and picking barbs out of their skin, I would imagine. But we've got a lovely nice ending, Bob. We've got the public enemy dancing in the ring. Crowd... Luckily this time behind the guardrails after previous issues that Johnny and Rocco's had with the fans dancing in the ring. But they're dancing, the fans are dancing, everybody's happy, the credits start rolling. But just to kind of carry on with this beautiful soap opera that we've got with this kind of, this drama from the hood. Public enemies dancing in the ring, a pair of hoodies, the pair of hoodies from last week, are revealed as the gangsters. New Jack and Mustafa from Smoky Mountain Wrestling. What did you make of this for a debut, Bob? Just this kind of couple of seconds that we had. Yeah, very good. Um, 
you know, they, they, they got this just about right. What, what I like was that it wasn't a pro wrestling style introduction. It wasn't a pro wrestling style beat down. It was very much a kind of more shoot type beat down. Also, it wasn't, but it looked more real than it should be. And it was paced better than your average kind of run out, hit a couple of signature moves and then kind of run off. This was more, yeah, we're just going to beat them up. Yeah, um, I mean, moving, it, moving straight onto the, the June 27 show, Bob, you're right. I mean, this kind of, it really just came in right at the death in June 20th. The credits were already rolling before we even seen New Jack Mustafa come in. And then the 27th show, we start with that aftermath. We've got the gangsters. They've already laid out the public enemy. But instead of it being a security officer or a local jobber coming out with a uniform on to take um, New Jack and Mustafa out, we get two cops coming out. They cuff New Jack and Mustafa, escort them for the building. As you say, I mean, it was a, I just thought it was a really, really cool atmosphere in the crowd where they legit didn't quite know what was happening. And then even when we've spoken about it before, we try to transfer that that kind of level of investment from the live audience over to the TV audience. We are then in the lucky position where we get Joey Styles backstage, really sombre, really kind of selling this as it was really an invasion. And it really came across came across well. It builds up New Jack and Mustafa, gives their real names, gives them their history and tying it in with the public enemy. They're a tag title match already sanctioned. And that's going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks. I mean, just just the full the full angle, Bob. I thought this was amazing how they've done this. Yeah, really well paced. Um, I think uh, Styles' promo gave the implication that they they weren't going to show us most of the beatdown, which I think is quite clever. But I, yep. I suspect we might get that next week. I mean, basically, Styles said that you know we, we we've been discussing all week whether we think we should air this or not. So I guess that's fair enough. Um, but yeah, it, a very, very well done introduction in that they didn't overdo it. I'm not sure I love the idea of them getting a title shot straight away. Um, uh, I, I don't know that I love it. I mean, I guess you could say, well, if, if the public enemy were, were asked for comment, you know, within a week, they say, yes, get them in a ring and we'll prove we're better than them. I might be tempted almost to have, you know, if we're going to deploy um, Bill Alfonso, this might be the kind of situation where I'd say, look, these guys have been arrested. Uh, we're not going to let them appear in the ring. That kind of thing. Build up to the match a bit more. Don't just like, go for it straight away. Uh, a minor critique, I think the debut's been excellent, and it's a, it's a classic example almost to a point of less is more. And it's it's just one of those things again, like the repackaging of Taz, it's one of these things that ECW just do well. I mean you look at the world heavyweight champion at the minute in ECW, you've got the Sandman there, used to be a surfer. You get Tommy Dreamer, used to come out in his little singlet, be a good looking guy, former frat boy. They they're just total different entities now and the same as they've done with Taz. And I mean looking back to possibly one of you and definitely one of my kind of top five or ten day well, reappearances, I suppose you would call it with Terry Funk. Going back to the turn of the year, this stuff with the gangsters has just been done brilliantly as well. And it's ECW just playing up to their strengths as usual. They do things that no one else does. And it comes across as just unbelievably fresh to a, a bit of a jilted audience at this minute with, with pro wrestling. ECW just do the right things the right way. And it, it comes across brilliantly. <laughs> And, and Raven, you literally you broke through your finger. It was the coolest! Crucifixion, vindication, absolution, and just one short step away from complete and total revenge. Tommy Dreamer, I feel your pain. Luna Vashon, I feel your pain. It's so liberating. I'm starting to feel good myself. Quote the Raven. Nevermore. Um, so I mean, moving on in the the 27th, uh, the 27th show, we've got Tommy Dreamer, and he's going to be going up against the Vampire Warrior. 
So right off from the right off for the start, we got a bulldog to dreamer in the aisleway onto the concrete. Luna then a bit torn attacks vampire with a chair. Um, Tommy's cut to the head already from that bulldog, but he manages to get back in control with a frying pan, low blow to the vampire warrior. Um, there's a throwaway slam. And then batters vampire with a steel rod. Tommy then repays that Elway bulldog and they again get up to the eagle's nest. Tommy Dreamer hits the vampire with a chair, takes a couple of shots to the back and then both of them are now bleeding. Lunard's just looking on torn for the ring as the two of them's brawling it and the crowd shouting from the middle ropes. They get back to ringside. Luna then kind of wipes the blood from her husband's face and then tastes it. Vampire again getting back into command in the ring. A chair gets set up in the middle, but Tommy manages to run on it, jumps, hits a vampire with a diving DDT for the win, and the crowd chant, he's hardcore. Now, Bob, we spoke about this, I thought they'd done really well with this ending here. We spoke about it earlier on when we were getting high spots and it was two counts and it wasn't going anywhere. I thought Luna had played a part brilliantly. The two of them, it, it did genuinely look like a blood feud in that ending I thought was thought was really good. It was a perfect bit to, to stop the match and it was really well delivered for both of them, I thought. Yeah, just a, a, a nice match and a, a nice to see Dreamer win one. It doesn't feel like that happens all that frequently at the moment. True. Um, certainly not in, in singles competition, but no, uh, an, an effective angle and, and again, kind of another, you know, Luna came in last month as a bolt on to this program with Raven and now Dream has got a match with Vampire Warrior, not against Raven. So it's almost like a, a again, a, a good way of continuing the feud without just doing X versus Y. Exactly. And I mean, we've then got that follow up promo from Luna as well. She bills herself as, as the nightmare of Raven. And then talking about her dream, Tommy. He's recalling the, the historic rivalries that we've seen in pro wrestling before, where it's Buzz Sawyer and Tommy Ratcher, the three birds and the Von Erics. But him and Raven, it'll just be utter violence. Now, moving on to kind of one of my favourite parts of the, the hardcore TV show, Bob, the Extreme Encyclopedia. Um, we've then got Jungle Jim Steele of WCW fame and Polly in 911 appear in an extreme encyclopedia. We then cut back to last week and see 911 going pretty much choke slam crazy. Um, Jungle Jim, Jungle Jim Steel makes his entrance, the fans turn their back on him and it's kind of nice of him to, I thought, recycle the Tasmaniacs old furry singlet for, for this guy, Bob. Would you, do you well, want to well, give everybody well, a wee bit of history? Well, I don't know how much history I can give you, but I can certainly say he was, uh, within uh, WCW at the beginning of last year as this gimmick in this role. Um, I think he made it to pay per view. I've got a feeling it was maybe Johnny be bad last February. I don't know whether I might plug it out from in there. I'm, I'm pretty sure he wrestled one match for WCW on pay per view. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, but this is an existing gimmick, even though it is a horrid <laughs> gimmick. I mean, it's. <laughs> You know, I mean, well, we, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll get in after. I mean, you, you'll wrap up Paul Heyman's comments at the end of this segment. Um, but this is the this is the original WCW knockoff of the Ultimate Warrior, and yes. there's there's uh, there's references to the current WCW knockoff of the Ultimate Warrior, and I don't know which one's worse. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, I don't think you could even. It's, what one's worse suggests that one of them's better, Bob. So, I mean, That's I true. think we'll, I think we'll just leave it there. Oh, um, I so suspect I mean, that the guy who plays Jim Steele is slightly better than the guy who plays the Renegade. <laughs> it would be hard not to, to be fair. Um, so, I mean, we've got a quick match here. Jim Steele goes for that, a corner splash, but 911 moves out of the road, grabs him by the throat over the ropes, drags him back into the middle of the ring, mammoth choke slam, gets the three count within the minute. But um, ECW faithful, being as they are, don't chant for one more time. They chant for four more times after 911's four choke slams last week. They want to beat the record and they want to go for five. Fourth 
choke slam for Cardinal Jim Steele. A record tying fourth choke slam. another choke slam. the crowd then yell three more times and Paul E dedicates the, the third choke slam to everyone at CNN Towers in Atlanta you get the fourth gets nailed in honour of Steele's poorly conceived kind of alter ego in WCW as you mentioned Bob the renegade at the minute so that one's dedicated as the fourth choke slam. 9-1-1 then gets the record and a shout out from Paul E dangerously to Bill Alfonso and Jungle Jim is then inducted into the, the hallowed halls of EC fucking W. Bob, what did you make of this segment? Um, worked really, really well with the live crowd. Came across really, really well on TV. I've got, again, a bit like a couple of weeks ago, I've got wider concerns that, okay, now you've done five, what, you're going to do six next <laughs> time? Where does it end? And at what point do you overdo it? Um, but yeah, you, you, you can only be so critical when an angle comes across so well on television. And this did. Um, and 911 in this kind of role is, is as good as it gets in terms of a guy who just plays his role to perfection. It's perfect. Um, yeah. and, and it also gave Paul Heyman slash Paulie Dangerously a platform just to rant for a bit, uh, <laughs> which is, which is always quite entertaining. Yeah, very effective segment. Again. And heaven, you know, heaven forbid Paul E be the type to hold a grudge as well, well, Bob. That as well. So moving on, last couple of bits of the month for ECW's Hardcore TV. We cut to heavily, heavily edited highlights of Cactus Jack and Sandman. They had a recent barbed wire match. Four ring posts, no ropes around them, just barbed wire. Um, that was for the ECW title, and we already see Jack getting draped over the barbed wire, acting as ropes. Sandman leaping the remaining steel to the outside, stamping on Jack. The champion then chokes Cactus Jack with a wire before leg um, dropping the leg, leaving Jack tied up in said barbed wire. Cactus cuts Sandman with a cheese grater on the outside to try and get a bit of momentum. But he lays out Sandman, wraps up that fist with barbed wire as we've seen the last one, nails the Sandman, the Sandman's on Dream Street for, I don't know how long you want to count, 10, 20, 30 seconds. As per the knockout, we have a new ECW chat, no we don't. Um, good old Bill Alfonso comes out, cites the rules and title changes with a, with a 10 count, same as a count out, doesn't order a, doesn't order a, a title change. In orders a continuance of the match. Cactus is just suffocated at this point with barbed wire right around his throat. A pretty worryingly long time. Um, he gets launched to the outside through the barbed wire on the other side of the ring. And Alfonso calls for the bell. Um, Todd Gordon, Commissioner Gordon again charges the ring at this point. Referee Jim Molino actually strips off his referee, referee top. Goes for Alfonso, but the scourge of ECW then actually levels Todd Gordon, knocks him out, runs away to the back. Bob, he's kind of got a point again here. It was purely a count-out victory. Bill Alfonso with a point again? Well, it wasn't a count out victory. It was a, it was a guy who can't answer a 10 count. There is a, you know, the, that yeah. count in a Texas death match. Um, or, well, a WCW version of it. Um, but no, I mean, well, 
you know, it, they wouldn't have done the finish without this as the end. They wouldn't have, you know, they weren't obviously going to take the title off, um, off Sandman. So yeah, I, I, I didn't mind it, but yeah, this is, you know, this is the way to build heat. If you want to build heat on the referee, we're going to discuss it in a bit and whether this is ultimately going to be effective. But having a, a world title change and having your effectively number one heel come out and reverse it is, yeah, it's a good way to build heat. There's, there's and no dare I say, it wasn't exactly lukewarm before it as well. No, he's re- no. For I the mean, lengthy time that he's been on that show and the amount of just pure hatred, I would dare say. I mean, to, to, to talk about the match, I, I did watch this match in full. I did manage to get a, a copy of the uh, right. tape. Um you you haven't missed much compared to what makes it to TV. Those edited highlights are more. We're going to take out some of the much slower moments of the uh, of the match. I didn't actually think it was all that good. Um, right. uh, live arena reports I've read in, in, in the talk suggested that people really enjoyed it, and people in the in the arena really enjoyed it. But it to me it was a very very overly slow kind of you know because you've only got a few different gimmicks you can do with the barbed wire thing and there's a lot you can't do um and so it ends up being like it's almost like a a match without a ring which isn't really much of a match well i guess in ecw it can be um but yeah no i didn't think this was a tremendous match there was a couple of good spots but i don't know that the barbed wire as as dangerous as it is i don't know that it comes across on television all that well it's like mm. the cheese grater spots it's like well i know it's dodgy i know it's dangerous but it doesn't look it it doesn't it doesn't to me have the same impact as say when sandman whacks someone over the back with a with a cane yeah that looks like that's a big wrestling type move just to wrap some barbed wire around your fist and then just kind of gouge someone's you know, forehead. It's it's dangerous, but to me it isn't dangerous in the right way. And yeah, this match wasn't all that I didn't think. Just my opinion. I think people other people would have would No, I think that's, that's fair enough. Did. And I mean you can see how that's been transferred onto the T V output as well, Bob. I mean dare I say they learned that lesson the hard way when they booked the the Tully Blanchard match in January. They know what sells, they know what's good and they know what ain't and they can masterfully edit that into a couple of minutes on TV as opposed to drawing that out as a, a full kind of match, and especially when you're trying to get this Bill Alfonso um, kind of storyline over as well. We're kind of standing in for the rules. Why would he let that go on? Why would it be a big, long match? I think they sold it brilliantly, and as you say, it maybe wasn't the best kind of TV match when it comes across through a through a TV and for us kind of going several thousand miles it maybe doesn't transfer quite as well as when you're stood a couple of feet away from it and you can kind of taste the taste the blood coming off of these guys I mean I think they just edit it as good as ever when they kind of know what their audience wants to see they give you just enough and then they don't want you to get to a state where, the, where you're seeing too much and maybe getting maybe getting tired of it. And I mean, just the last couple of bits of the the month for Hardcore TV, we've got a really, really good um, pre-tape promo from the Sandman, sitting smoking in a darkened room saying he's getting used to this full champion situation. And we then get a very brief look at New Jack and Mustafa. We hear from them for the first time. They close out the month. They're standing on Johnny Grunge's new car that he was showing to Rocco earlier in the month. And they call the public enemy the original pranksters. And New Jack and Mustafa, they are the original gangsters. Bob, really good month for the TV overall. What do you think? Yeah, nothing, um, nothing remarkable, nothing kind of that we could hang our show on, but four very consistently good shows, decent action, you know, perhaps a little light on the wrestling front. Well, I, I think essentially because Benoit, Guerrero, Milenko, Etal are all in, uh, well, they're all in Japan apart from Benoit, as, as we'll go on to discuss, is actually in the WWF this month. Um, but yeah, a lot of the wrestling guys weren't there, so it was very much a kind of brawl heavy month. Um, and yeah, as we'll discuss in, uh, uh, in a minute, I, yeah, a good month, but some, some concerns as well about, you know, next month and the month after, but we'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's a fluke. Well, I know it's no fluke. Woman knows it's not a fluke. You might think it is because all you see is a beer drinking, cigarette smoking, pool hustling, scumbag. <laughs> With the world's heavyweight champion, Shane Douglas, the 
college educated, history teaching, professor of the mat wrestler. I beat him. I not only beat him, I beat him and his best friend, Cactus Jackal, the same night. And you know what? Now that I think about it, it wasn't even that hard. Cactus Jack, I gotta give you a little credit. You're one tough SOB. Barbed wire match, you were this close to becoming world heavyweight champion. For so long in my career, I never cared about winning. I never cared about pinning somebody to the mat. All I wanted to do was get into a good fight, smoke my cigarettes, drink my beer, check out my woman, and swing a big stick. I got some bad news for all you. <laughs> I'm starting to like this. It doesn't get any better being the heavyweight champion of the world. I'm starting to feel it in my heart every time I go out to the ring. I've never been so happy. Can you imagine how extreme you're going to have to get to take this belt away from me? Now that I like being heavyweight champion of the world. So, Bob, just wrap up the, the show for this month. A couple of things we've kind of touched on briefly in the show, but I just want to kind of talk about them again um, just before we kind of got on to kind of almost looking into the crystal ball and try to predict the roster of ECW in the next couple of months. This, you know, we touched on it more last month, but in general, the kind of style of ECW, do you think, I mean, we spoke about this Bill Alfonso thing where it's almost art imitating life, having this kind of troubleshooting referee in here to try and curb in the kind of rein it in a little bit. Where do you see them going with this kind of style and the, I suppose, short term and then touching on long term as well? I mean, we don't want to go into it too much, but where do you see this going for ECW? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's... Again, it's one of those things where I get the sense to a point the burnout factor from a live audience perspective will be much longer where it be in ECW versus be in a, in front of maybe a Manhattan center type raw audience or, you know, I don't suppose center state, but you know, generally, you know, we have to go back kind of 10, 15 years to when it was, you know, things were more regional and you'd have, you know, companies running a show in, in, in the same arena every Friday night. I don't get the sense you're going to burn out this audience quite that quickly. But the point is, is that what, what not only are you setting the bar higher and higher, you're also delivering, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But the point is, is that if you start telling this audience, yes, the more you push, the more we're going to go. Where are we going to be in six months' time? Where's the ceiling? Where are we, when are we going to hit? Or are we literally going to hit the ceiling? I don't know. Um, but yeah, and it's also just whether, you know, the matches start to you know, stop being believable, you know, and it's kind of the, the more kind of big spots you do that don't end matches, the more you've got to do to end the match. And you either end up doing something silly or you end up with kind of quite anticlimactic finishes. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's there's work to be done. And again, with the kind of nine on one thing, it worked fantastically in front of the live audience. It's not to be critical of the segment, but the entire thing was the previous record was four choke slams. Now we're going to do five. Fair enough. But what happens when they see it next time? They're going to be chanting, "We want six. Okay, you do six. And then it gets to the point where it's like you've got to do fifteen. Well, it's like, well, if, if the move's that dangerous after one, aren't you just killing people? I mean, it, well, that was the gimmick, ironically, with Heyman this month, was that John Dibsdale was dead after the fall. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a risk and reward thing and a long-term situation of, is this all worth it? And are they going to be smart enough to kind of see the wood from the trees and just be able to say, look, we can't keep going here because... What eventually happens is you just end up finding it, making it really difficult to pop an audience. That's what happens because there is a ceiling. And once you hit that ceiling, it's like, ah, we've already seen that. And that was kind of like the thing when, uh, when Benoit did the kind of super bomb off the, uh, off the, uh, off the top turnbuckle or off the table. It was like, well, great spot, but how do you top it? Yeah. Um, and, and you get to the point where it's like, well, you can't. And then it's like, well, okay, now what? That, that would be my concern. And the full, the full kind of crowd investment and that Jungle Jam Steel angle, where it was, they were quite happy at five, he'd broke the record. Do you think they would have been that happy to start them at five if they didn't at least think, but probably know that next week they're going to be going for six? Cause I don't, no, I, I don't think, think so. I, I think um, you're right. 
the, the next time I will want to pay is they're going to want six. Exactly. I mean, we've already they've kind of been educated to an extent, whether they know it or not, but they've been educated, ECW audience, where I think they know when 911 can come out. It's, I don't think anybody's under the illusion that 911's sitting backstage on a bucket at the curtain just ready for the 911 chant, and then he's going to go. They know when they're going to get that 911 chant. They know he's going to come out. They know he's going to do the choke slam spot, which was originally maybe one or two or a double choke slam. Now it's getting to the four and five stages. If you listen to the, if you listen to that crowd for long enough, they would quite happily book the show into a, into a car crash. And I mean, it's just trying to get it before that kind of old happy day spot, that jump in the shark spot with Fonzie, where they just want to kind of curb it in before that. And I mean, almost tying it into that, Bob, do you think that's where this Bill Alfonso situation could really be a stroke of genius where you've got almost like you're kind of giving them this like a, a kind of carrot and stick approach where you're kind of giving them these spots and these angles and then you've got Bill Alfonso playing his role with perfection as this just kind of almost like a, a kind of headmaster coming in or maybe like a supply teacher that thinks he's a headmaster where it's just kind of try to kind of give them their own rules and I mean do you think that's that's maybe what the plan is in the background with this and I mean how do you think that character's really came across this month it's like the first full month they have having them well we're in the first full month of Bill Alfonso and yet we've still got a double dog collar match with X number of tables <laughs> we've still got a barbed wire uh, rope match um, and next month we've got the brawl game so yes I mean I They've done a phenomenal job with Alfonso in such a short space of time. Admittedly, it's almost kind of the perfect character in terms of it's it's the one that, you know, the, the one that denies you is the one that w- w- will quickly get the heat. Um, I just don't know how this pays off. Like, I don't know, maybe he starts managing people and, and they kind of try and transfer the heat. But the the it's believable because you feel he's impartial in that you feel like he hates everyone equally as much. So it's kind of a believable character. But he loses authority with the audience if he starts favouring one of his own guys. And I think the character stops making sense. But if that's the case, where, where do you make money with this? Because he's not the kind of guy that he'll he'll draw heat, but it's like well, he's not involved in any of the matches. He's just a, a really over-commissioner right now, mm. which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But I don't know, I don't know where it ends. And I mean, it's just trying to get to that payoff, as you say. I mean, what, what is that end goal? I mean, we saw him getting the quick pop shot at Todd Gordon and running for the hills. That kind of builds up to an extent, but then what's next? Mm. Todd, Todd Gordon then hits him by. I mean, is that going to sell tickets? Todd Gordon versus Bill Alfonso coming to, coming to November to remember maybe, but uh, it's true. I mean, talking about the sustainability of that, can I say that with the hot shot booting and then the, the kind of Bill Alfonso was the payoff with that. Sustainability, I, I think at this moment in ECW, for once, is kind of gearing away from the violence and gearing away from the kind of blood and the brawls and all that kind of stuff. I think the big worry for them at this minute, as we've seen it this month, where there wasn't really much remarkable with that. Kind of, I just loved that bit with Tommy Dreamer with the, the broken fingers and writhing about in the ring. That Cactus Jack promo was phenomenal. Aside from that in-ring stuff, as you said yourself, there wasn't that much. And when we spoke about the crowd being educated with regards to 911 and what to expect for him, they've possibly been maybe overexposed to good wrestling as well. When we really noticed that this month, we know Guerrero, no Malenko, no Benoit, no Al Snow, limited Scorpio. And I think the big worry at this point for ECW going forward, Bob, has got to be this roster. Yeah, and well, and, and no Sabu as well. Let's not forget that. Well, true, Sabu's kind of hiatus, I suppose, probably the best word to use with him. I mean, we've lost a lot of kind of really solid in-ring hands this month. I mean, where do you see this roster in the next couple of months, Bob? Obviously, none of these guys are under contract. You've got a big dog in New York. You've got a big dog in Atlanta. You've even got, with the likes of Sabu in particular, you've got Japan, whether it's all Japan, New Japan, Zero One. Where do you see this roster going in the next couple of months? I mean, first and foremost, I think we need to start with Benoit with this this kind of tryout that he's had with WWF. We spoke about it last last month, maybe April, where we were talking about the the kind of strengths of this ECW roster, but almost 
maybe not try to dig ourselves into a grave, but could these guys be going elsewhere? I mean, what do you make of this Benoit WWF situation? You think it's a winner, it's a loser, who for? What's your thoughts? Well, we, we ended the month on the Benoit thing, and, and as much as we haven't recorded that segment, we will have discussed it further on the RF part uh, earlier. Um, we're recording that show Saturday, by the way, so it's difficult to, to forward back reference something. Um, but yeah, Bob, I think we, we have end- a time machine that we go on every month. You can understand this conversation more than you expect. Yes, all right, fair enough. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think where the Benoit thing left was they want him, he wants to join, but he doesn't want to give up his Japan commitments and they don't want him to wrestle in Japan. So that might be a non-starter. Um, but yeah, it's... It's kind of reassuring to know they're looking at Benoit in a way, in a sense that it's like, well, he's been really good for ages now. Why is he doing it at ECW and not in one of the big two? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, as you say, it's difficult in the sense that they've just got no protection over their own stars. And if WCW are going to have this this extra hour of programming and if they're going to look to recruit some new talent... I'm pretty sure WCW have burnt out on all the old guys that are available Hogan-wise, and so it's like, well, if we want to try guys that we haven't tried before, it's largely this group of guys. This is largely the best unattached guys in America, and, and in some cases further afield. And you can see them coming in and looking at, you know, a, a few different names. There's, there's a load of names under discussion. I mean, they won't sign them all. Um, even guys like Tommy Dreamer, who I think would be a mistake, um... Public Enemy, uh, that'd be fine if we could get them against the Nasty Boys, but I, I, I don't know they're going to be able to have that kind of match in WCW that, that we want them to have. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting. Basically, it's it. Uh, I anticipate a fair amount of turnover um, because I think now that there's the second Monday Night program, part of it is going to be we need to sign Benoit just to stop the others getting them because you know. <laughs> Even if, even if you're, if you're at the top of, of, of WCW, even if for one reason or another, well, we can't really get Benoit into where we want to get him into for X, Y, or Z. The fact is, I'd rather Benoit sitting on my bench than playing for the opposition. You know what and I mean? And then I say I would rather have Benoit sitting on my throne as WWF's King of the Ring as well. Well, <laughs> well said. Um, but yeah, so I think a lot of it's almost going to be, you know, had had they not been moving for a Monday night show, perhaps, you know, the situation changes. Because, you know, the, Benoit's been around for a few months now. He's been excellent for a long while. Um, you can say the same for someone like Guerrero, who we, we saw, you know, as, you know, as far back as November 94, and he's been doing it for a while. Now, the talent's out there, but I think there's a lot more incentive to sign them um, in terms of if you're WWF and you can see WCW going for a more older guy type roster, you can pick your spots more. But if it's more now, okay, WCW might be looking at these guys, we're going to have to move them up. Yeah, I can see a lot of movement, long story short. And for ECW, it's tricky. I mean, they've done a couple of things very well, which is one, they've managed to make a lot out of very little with guys like Tommy Dreamer, uh, Sandman, Raven... Uh, to an extent, Douglas, they, they, they will back themselves in whatever situation to make the next guy, regardless of what that looks like. So I don't get the sense they're massively concerned, but equally, ECW is a really good mix generally in terms of it's a balance between having great wrestling and having great brawling and great characters and great promos and great stories. I think the great wrestling is a really good antithesis to everything else and it's a really good thing where this this very kind of smart audience can get their fix almost. Um, theoretically, I suppose the one good thing is that you can, you know, Al Snow walked in and had a great match with Chris Benoit. Al Snow was, was a guy with no character, no build, no nothing. He came in and had a great match. So theoretically, if you can find the guys, you can keep that fairly fluid. Um, but yeah, they're going to have to be on their toes, I think, in the next few months, because I can see a lot of names going out and coming in. And as I say, if we're looking at Sabu, a guy who we believe negotiated with both the WWF and WCW at the back end of last year, I would be more inclined to to say, you know what, we, we, we've got a bridge, but let's not burn it. We need you now, Sabu. We, we, we need you back in in the tent. Um, so yeah, long story short, they're going to have to be watchful and I think they're going to lose access to some of the guys. 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they lose access to some guys that don't really make sense, like the public enemy, maybe even like Mikey Whiprex, you know, something stupid like that, where it's like someone's just signing them for the sake of signing them. Um, but yeah, that there are, there are a number of guys right now that they feature in the last six months that are absolutely ready for the big time. Benoit, Douglas, um, guys like that. As to where they'll go, uh, I don't know. It looks like Douglas is WWF bound. Uh, Benoit, I don't know with Benoit. Because it, 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 I, I get the sense they both want to do the deal, but I don't think Benoit wants to give up Japan. Um, and I don't know how that that changes things. We've got on, Dale. I've been talking for about five minutes. Off well, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Brutally honest, Bob. I think the, the full story is there is a lot of people that will be attracted to me. I mean, especially when you've got the full contract situation. They know they can come in, give these, well, at least some of these guys a couple of dollars and they're going to come over. But, I mean, for me, Douglas, I reckon, is done. Douglas is, he needs the big time. He's deserved it with the last year, 18 months he's put in with ECW. Douglas isn't going to get any better in the next 12 months. Exactly. And, in the kind of arena that he's in, he needs to try to sell. He's not going to get a better chance than there is at the minute, especially when we're seeing where WWF is right now. You can see him slotting into not straight into a main event, but it's certainly working his way up in the next kind of couple of years, I would say. He walks um, in ben, as the best promo in the company, which is uh, not massive praise, but it's it's a weird situation. And Douglas can walk in. In a company that doesn't particularly value uh, wrestling ability all that high, near as WCW at this stage, um, and he walks in and he's already the best talker they've got, which is a, is a very good place to be. I was like, mate, is he better than Shawn Michaels? Um, yes, I, I, I would say he yeah. probably is. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Performance-wise, I would probably go with Sean. I think Sean's definitely... Oh, Christ, a, Sean's, Sean's a, a good yeah, couple of things. he's in the cusp of a wave at the minute. I don't think Douglas could really kind of perform at that level. But promo-wise, I think he walks straight in. I mean, the only argument I would really have is maybe like a Jim Carnett or a Jerry Lawler, which one of them doesn't wrestle and one of them shouldn't wrestle, really. Um, Benoit, I can see a bit further down. I, I, I can see the benefits for both parties, but... Benoit strikes me as that kind of guy where he will, is kind of more old school. He, he's a huge fan of the Dynamite Kid. He's got the old school values where I think he will honour the stuff that he's got in Japan. Could that work to his detriment? We're not getting that big deal. Probably if he does do that. But I would like to see him in a bigger stage. We've, we spoke about him going way back to last year with kind of coming in at that August NWA title tournament, myself and Lacey at the AAA show. We know what the guy can do. I'd love to see him in a bigger stage. Would I say he's ready at the minute? I think give him a couple of months. Give him maybe the rest of 95. See how he gets on. See how that promo comes on. He can tell that he spent time with Paul Heyman. He was coming on with his pre-tapes that he was doing, kind of selling that ice cold gimmick. Talking about ice cold gimmicks, we've got Dean Malenko, he's colder than ice. I, I don't really see him kind of really going to one of the big two with the kind of sports entertainment side of the business that we've been seeing in the last year or two coming through, particularly in WWF. Um, a, a terrific wrestler, but as you say, even in WCW, which kind of looking back to maybe six, seven years ago when we were still talking Jim Crockett, really quite a sad state there when the wrestling isn't the pinnacle because it always was and it always should be in Atlanta but I, I don't really see him as much as I would like seeing it. I mean I, I, I'm going to throw out a random one for you Bob as you were talking about with the public enemy and Mikey Whipwreck 911 to one of the big two is a heater do you see it maybe like a kind of almost like a diesel Shawn Michaels situation could you see 911 coming in with a another, like a Razor Ramon or a 1-2-3 kid or even a Steve Austin in WCW. Do you see him kind of filling a role in that kind of aspect? Um, could do, but equally I get the feeling that as good as 9-1-1 is, and well, sorry, as over as he is and as good a job they've done with him, I get the feeling that both companies think, yeah, we could make that with someone else. You know, and, and to a point, 
to a point they're kind of right it's not a it's not an especially complicated character it's not something that especially takes that much time and plus we we are in you know if you move into one of the big two you move into the land of the giants and then all of a sudden he's not that big true T- taking the wwf and he's smaller shorter than diesel and he's shorter than sid taking the well, WWF, he's, uh, wwf you've got a sad wcw you've got a big boba that's kind of come back to that role that he had in the 80s where he pretty much does that and, and wcw true. were about to debut a guy called you know the giant we think uh paul yeah, White. That's right. Is, who's, who's know, over seven foot seven so feet, so yeah, no so. I think will be the answer on 911 I, I don't think he stands out enough and equally I, I get the sense that it's like well we could we could turn one of our current guys into that kind of role um yeah no That's no true. would be no would be my answer for that one and I mean last last bit for the month as well Bob just because I love it personally I want you to book it Bob I want you to pick one guy at ECW Shane Douglas aside as we pretty much know where he's going at this point, it's pretty much signed, sealed and delivered, apart from being signed, sealed and delivered. Give me one name at ECW where you think should go, whether it's WWF, WCW, a name, a company, and what you would do with them. Funny, literally I had that idea in the break. I thought, well, my idea was to do one for each, and I like my idea a little bit Well, on you go, one for each. Um, I would send Benoit to WWF, uh, are we talking about like fantasy booking, or are we talking about what we think is going to happen? I want what you want, Bob. Okay, I, I want Benoit and WWF just because the batting average of their wrestlers need to go up about three or four points. Um, and he's the, like, he's the kind of guy who goes in there and like, oh, I'd like to see him against Owen Hart, or I'd like to see him against Shawn Michaels. There's, there's a ton of really good matches there, and the WWF work rate at the moment is so low that he could come in and almost, yeah, we, we talk about the impact for one, two, three kid and how good he's, oh god, what a match that'd be. Um, but yeah, but, but while the WWF would be a, a no-brainer if we can make it happen, uh, to WCW, oh, that's a good question. Um, funnily enough, I wouldn't mind seeing Douglas in WCW, but I guess that, that rules that one out. I, I, I will go with the public enemies in WCW in the, in a, what I would want. I would love to see them have a few matches with the Nasty Boys. The nasties, I, th- yeah. I think that could be tremendous. Um, so yeah, those are my two picks. What about you, Dale? I would probably agree in the Benoit situation. He's definitely a standout for me, but what he could probably do in the next couple of years. I would be more tempted to actually put him down to a WCW. I would love to see Chris Benoit and Owen Hart. I would love to see him and Shawn Michaels, even Bret Hart as well. I mean, I think there's some cracking matches, but I think WCW being more historically for what it stood for with the days of kind of Dusty Rhodes and Flair and Steamboat. And I think Benoit could really start a revolution down there with kind of getting that kind of young blood in that WCW really needs with the full Hogan and Flair situation where they're still on top even Vader's been about kind of five six years at this point I think Benoit and Sting would be a great one for me Sting being the perennial baby face Benoit coming in as that kind of no nonsense bad guy I would like to see that WWF wise I would probably go with I would we're booking for what we want we don't I think it will happen, but we're putting what we want, Bob. I would go with Dean Malenko to WWF for the same reasons, I think, as you would say, Benoit, and it's just the wrestling, the wrestling ability. I would like to see Benoit and Sting personally, just because I think it'd be a good match, but Malenko, I think, could bring so much to WWF where it's almost shifting the tide, where it's getting away from the kind of gimmicks that we've seen kind of come out and sometimes die in the same night this year in WWF as kind of Mantor or Man Mountain Rock or, and Dean Malenko comes in, doesn't talk, puts on good matches, put him with Bret Hart, put him with Owen Hart, put him with Shawn Michaels, bring his kind of mat game up a bit and even just seeing that partnership with Malenko being the ground game, Shawn being the kind of Babyface selling, kind of high spots, athletic kind of side. And I mean, I think Malenko would almost be what a Bob Backlund they thought it was going to be with kind of getting that ground game in. So I would go with Malenko, WWF, Benoit to WCW. I have one other name, um, which is a guy we haven't actually mentioned. I mean, to a point, fair enough, given that he was in, uh, 
he was in WCW less than a year ago. But I know I, what you're going to say, and I think yeah. it's a very mouth-watering prospect because the man himself has come on leaps and bounds in, in ECW. Uh, Cactus Jack, either yeah. side. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think it makes much difference. Uh, you know, I, I suspect that. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, what well, I guess I, I'd say to WWF, given that WWE had him and, and clearly didn't see it. Um, but yeah, even if it was back to WCW with a renewed vigor to push him, he he's probably too good right now to be down there. Um, his kind of gimmick fits the kind of thing that WWF might repackage a bit into something that's you know, a little bit more character driven. But he's he's out there enough where I don't actually think you'd have to change a lot. You could just package him slightly differently and he'd fit right in the WWF uh, and he'd be excellent. So, after another thrilling episode of Book It Bob, that pretty much does us for the ECW section of this month's podcast. Obviously, do go back and listen to the WWF and WCW parts of the show if you haven't already. Bob, we're now out of the, the time machine, back into, back into modern day mode. Put yourself over. Oh, okay. Um, yes, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Bobby Bamba. Uh, and, and and everything else, Dell, you're going to cover, I think. Um, Pretty so, much. Yes. Uh, wrestling, wrestling, twenty YRS. We are on Twitter. Wrestling twenty YRS on Facebook. Wrestling twenty YRS dot com for pretty much all of the above. Cover the blogs. Cover the rankings for the end of the month. Subscribe to the RSS feed on there as well. I did do a long write up about Cactus Jack this month on the website. Exactly. That's we'll get month. that promo and just your usual kind of. Top quality wrestling broadcasting journalism, to be quite honest, Bob. I'll say it for you so you don't sound overly egotistic. Thank you very um, much. Kind of loads of stuff on there. Obviously, sign up for that newsletter as well. We don't spam. We don't really care enough to kind of look into how we I don't can know how, spam. Yeah. So. We don't because we can't, which, which is a very mm. different attitude. But yes, um, no, you sign up to our email newsletter. You'll get one email a month. Just as a uh, reminder of the podcast and uh, a select a selection of the blogs. Although I'm not actually writing probably enough blogs to make a selection at the moment. It's just all of them. Um, but I am at the moment writing something about Alex Wright as well, which we'll touch on. Uh, you, you want to find Sorry, out Bob, about... introduce him correctly. Das Wundergut. That's the, the Wonder Punk, Alex Wright. Um, <laughs> but yes, and also if you want to find out about... Uh, the early days of Triple H in WCW. I don't think there's really enough for a full blog, so all of that kind of ends up in the Alex Wright thing, given that their their early stories are quite intertwined, and what a what a fork in the road that is. Um, but yes, yeah, so all, all of the um, yeah, so on the email news that aside, you'll get the the main podcast, and you'll also get the, a selection of the uh, the best articles of the month. And uh, talking of the podcast itself, last but not least, sign up my tunes, RSS feed on the website. Give us a like, give us a comment. Give us a subscription, give us five gold stars on there and leave a review as well if you can. And for Bob Bamba, this is Del Muir and the Wrestling 20 Years Ago podcast. And until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>